Okay gang, chapter 3, Water Supply and Testing Procedures. This is kind of a good news, bad news chapter. Good news is there's no real math problems for us to work. The bad news is it's a lot of information and key terms for you guys to remember. So let's get started. Objectives. Explain the characteristics of a gravity water system, a pumping water system, a combination water system, and a high pressure water system. Define average daily consumption, maximum daily consumption, and peak hourly consumption. Discuss needed fire flow. Understand the differences between the system adequacy and the system reliability of a water system. Discuss the distribution of a water system, including the primary feeders, secondary feeders, and distribution mains. Know the difference among the various types of hydrants used in a water system. Explain the recommended markings for fire hydrants. Explain the maintenance and testing procedures for fire hydrants. And identify various types of emergency water supplies. Okay, as we know, we're talking about fire department hydraulics. And we could not talk about fire hydraulics unless we figured out and knew a little bit about where our water came from and how it actually gets to our fire hydrants and our fire trucks. So this is what we're going to dive into in this chapter. Kind of the where, how, and why. Experience is a good teacher, but even the most experienced officer must have some basic understandings of how the system works in their communities. This chapter outlines the basic elements of water supply systems and presents a practical method of testing the capacity of the system. Throughout most cities, there is an adequate water supply for fire protection. However, what would happen if some of these systems broke down and we need more water? Supplementary supplies, such as swimming pools, lakes, and rivers, should be planned out to use for fire protection for just such an emergency. Maybe it's a flood, maybe it's an earthquake, tornado, or something of that nature that disables your water system. And then, quite obviously, after such natural disasters, you could quite possibly have numerous fires. So this is how we can plan ahead and mitigate the problem quickly and effectively by planning out these alternate water supplies. There are two basic ways water gets delivered out to our homes and our hydrants. One is through a gravity system. The other is through a pumping system. Gravity systems have water stored at a point that is elevated above the distribution system and flows by gravity. A good example of this would be a reservoir um, high up on a hill or a mountain with feeder lines going into the community. Other examples are your water tanks that you see throughout your community. The most reliable gravity system is one where the water is collected in ponds or reservoirs without the use of a pumping system. Unfortunately, few communities have a gravity system. A pumping system depends upon pumps to keep the pressure available for public consumption and fire protection. Combination systems are the most common used today, and they use a cross between gravity systems and pumps to feed the municipality and ensure that the water demands are met. In a combination system, the water is pumped from a lower source into a large storage tank. These tanks are usually filled up at night by pumps and then fed by gravity to the end user down the line. If extra pressure is needed, the gravity system can be helped by the pumps. In some communities, 
Water systems used for fire protection are a totally independent system than the domestic water. Many of these systems are designed as high pressure systems. These high pressure systems provide high pressure to hydrogen outlets at all times. This permits the effective use of hose streams without the use of a fire truck to boost the pressure. It's important to note with these systems, they are totally separate from the drinking water. So a lot of times these systems are also composed of potable water or non-drinkable water as because their primary use is for firefighting. Most water supplies are both fire protection and public use. These dual purpose systems should be able to support sufficient water for fire protection and at the same time meet the maximum consumption demands for its domestic purposes. Consumption for domestic purposes generally falls into three categories. Average daily consumption, maximum daily consumption, and peak hourly consumption. Meaning basically with the peak side, when everybody's home and everybody decides to wash their clothes, flush their toilet, take a shower, how much water is being used. Then of course the max is how much water can be put through the system. And then the average is just daily consumption, how much water is used in the system throughout the day. Average daily consumption can be figured as follows. The total amount of water used divided by the number of days in a year. So, for example, 7,300,000 gallons divided by 365 days equals out to about 20,000 gallons used per day in the municipality. Maximum daily consumption is the amount of water used in a community during a 24-hour period over a three-year period. The maximum daily consumption is normally between 150 and 200 percent of the average daily consumption. Peak hourly consumption is the maximum amount of water that can be expected to be used in any given hour of the day. The peak hourly consumption can vary between 150 and 400 percent of the average hourly consumption during a peak day. Required fire flow. Water systems should be designed to supply the needed fire flow to every section of the community while domestic use is at the maximum daily consumption rate. The needed fire flow is the amount of water deemed required for firefighting purposes in order to confine a major fire to the building within a block or other group complex. The minimum needed fire flow for any given area within a community for a single fire is 500 gallons per minute, while the maximum is 12,000 gallons per minute. A water system is considered adequate when it can deliver the needed fire flow for the recommended duration of hours while domestic consumption is at the maximum daily rate. The recommended duration of hours varies with the needed fire flow. For example, the recommended duration is two hours when the needed fire flow is 2,500 gallons per minute or less, while the recommended duration is 10 hours when the needed fire flow is 10,000 GPM or greater. The ability to provide the desired flow depends largely on the size of the pipes within the system. The larger the pipes, the more gallons per minute you can get. While 6 inch pipe is considered to be the smallest size used, the increased capacity of larger pipes should be considered. If the size of the pipe is doubled, the flow is increased 6 times. If the size of the pipe is quadrupled, the flow increases 40 times. As you can see, an increase in the size of the pipe greatly enhances the capacity to flow water.
A water system is considered reliable when it can supply the needed fire flow for the number of recommended hours. The system must be designed so that the needed fire flow can still be supplied if a reservoir, excuse me, if a reserve is shut down for cleaning or repairs. A good reliable system has two or more primary feed lines that feed the rest of the system. Pressure, in most cases, the fire department pumpers are used to take the water from the hydrant at whatever pressure and boost the pressure to those necessary for working the hose streams. In order to overcome friction loss in the hydrant branch, the hydrant itself and the suction supply hose from the hydrant to the pumper must not have less than 20 psi. So meaning when you turn the hydrant on and it's going from the hydrant to the truck, you must have a minimum pressure of 20 pounds per square inch in order to get the water out of the ground. In large water systems, the water will move through three different classification of mains as it travels from the reservoir to the outlets. They are classified as follows, primary feeders, secondary feeders, and distribution mains. The size of the pipes are largest at the primary and go down all the way to the distribution mains. Primary feeders are large pipes that are used for moving water from the source of supply to the secondary feeders. The size of your primary feeders may vary from 48 inches in large cities to only 12 inches in smaller communities. Secondary feeders are smaller pipes than primary feeders, but larger than the distribution mains used in the grid system. Whenever possible, secondary feeders should be looped so that the water is supplied to the distribution mains from two different directions. So it's basically what we call a closed system. So imagine all the pipes, all the water lines in your community having water coming in from two different directions. So if something were to happen to one side, you have a redundancy and the system is still pressurized from the other point. Distribution mains are used to supply water directly to fire hydrants and for domestic purposes. Mains should be cross-connected so as to supply a grid throughout the buildup areas of the community. In a well-designed system, water is supplied to each hydrant from two directions. 12-inch mains are recommended on all principal streets, with 8-inch mains cross-connected in business districts. The recommended minimum size for mains in a residential area is 6 inches. Dead-end mains, which supply water from only one direction, exist in many communities, limiting the amount of water available for fire protection. So a good example of a dead-end main would quite possibly be a cul-de-sac. So you have water coming in from the opening in the cul-de-sac and then ending at the hydrant at the end of the cul-de-sac. And the water has nowhere left to go. So then that would be considered a dead-end main. Oftentimes with dead-end mains, you have to worry about sediment buildup. As again, the water only comes from one direction and is allowed to settle a lot easier. Control valves should be installed in water systems at strategic locations. This allows portion of the system to be shut down for repairs or other problems. That way you're not taking out the entire system. You're only blocking out the needed area to do the repair or maintenance. It is recommended that enough valves be installed that a break or a failure of the system will not require shutting down the length of pipe greater than 500 feet in commercial areas and 800 feet in residential areas. Here's a great picture of a control valve, also known as a gate valve.
Standards for hydrants are prepared by the AWWA. A standard hydrant is designed for a working pressure of 150 PSI and is tested at a pressure of 300 PSI. An installed hydrant with a single 2.5 inch outlet should be capable of flowing at a minimum of 250 gallons per minute. Hydrants with two 2.5 two inch outlets should be capable of flowing 500 gallons per minute. And hydrants with a 4 inch outlet should be capable of flowing a minimum of 1,000 gallons per minute. All hydrants should have clearance of three feet to operate properly in all directions. There are two basic types of hydrants in use today. One is the wet barrel hydrant and the second is dry barrel hydrants. And depending on the community you live in and the average temperature will dictate which one you have. A wet barrel hydrant are full of water at all times. They are primarily used when there is no threat of freezing temperatures. These are the hydrants you see in the movies that give you a geyser type spray when they are struck when a vehicle hits them. A valve is used between the main and the hydrant to isolate the hydrant in case of a break or a repair. Dry barrel hydrants are pretty common in the U.S. One of these hydrants, the valve controlling the water is located below the frost line. At the base of these hydrants, there is a drain valve which permits the hydrant barrel to be drained after use. So essentially, there is a valve below the ground. When you turn the hydrant at the top, it causes that valve to open, allowing water to come up out of the feeder lines into the hydrant. After you're done with it, you close the hydrant and then the water is allowed to leak out through that drain valve. Another advantage is that the dry barrel hydrant has a control valve that remains closed and no water is lost if the hydrant is broken and knocked off its base. Flush type hydrants. In flush type hydrants, the outlets and control valves are located below ground level. About the only place you will see this type of hydrant is at airports on the runway. One disadvantage of this type is that the hydrant is hard to see, especially at night. High pressure hydrants are normally installed on high pressure water mains that are independent of the domestic supply system. Pressures available on these hydrants will normally range between 160 and 180 PSI. The hydrants are designed to be extra heavy and may be provided with as many as four outlets. Hose lines used for firefighting operations can be laid directly to these hydrants without the use of fire department pumpers to boost the pressure. Dry hydrants are not connected to a positive pressure source of water. They are referred to as suction hydrants. And in some parts of the country, they are permanently installed hard suction lines. There is a strainer at one end and it gets its water from a nearby source, such as a pond, stream, creek, or river. While all the items outlined for consideration of dry hydrants apply to built up dry hydrants, built up dry hydrants can be designed to help take the stress placed on a regular hydrant by the hard suction hose. Most built up hydrants can supply a flow between 600 and 1000 gallons per minute. NMPA 291 recommends that hydrants be classified in accordance with their rated capacity at 20 PSI residual pressures. It would behoove you to know these classifications of hydrants as well as what color the bonnets are, meaning the top. 
A class AA hydrant is capable of supplying 1,500 gallons per minute or greater, and it has a light blue top. A class A green top can supply between 1,000 and 1,500 GPM. A class B or an orange top supplies 500 to 999 gallons per minute. And a class C is a red top and it supplies less than 500 gallons per minute. NFPA recommends that non-municipal hydrants be painted a color that distinguishes them from the municipality hydrants. An example of this is a private hydrant within a private enclosure can be colored at the owner's discretion. So let's say that you pull up to a business and that business has four fire hydrants and the business actually owns and is responsible for those fire hydrants. If the fire hydrants in your community are red, you would recommend that quite possibly those private hydrants be painted yellow. That way you know who is responsible for what. Oftentimes with private hydrants, they are behind the meter, meaning that the company will be charged for any water that comes out of them. Recommendations for hydrant spacing are based on the fire flow demands of a given area. It is desirable that hydrants be no more than 800 feet apart in any area of the city and not more than 500 feet apart in built up areas, meaning areas with lots of buildings and things of that nature. There are several options when dealing with emergency water supplies. In some cities, swimming pools are your best option. Water trucks or water tenders can also supply large amounts of water to remote locations. And cisterns are large storage tanks of water normally located beneath the street of a municipality. A lot of times they kind of contain runoff water or, or things of that nature. A fire flow test indicates the amount of water that is available in a particular section of the water system. The tests are conducted for new developments in towns to make sure that the hydrant flow the way they should. The ideal time for testing is when the system is at normal demand. Annual testing should be done on hydrants. You will need the following equipment to conduct a fire flow test. A pitot blade with a gauge that reads 0 to 100 psi. A hydrant cap with a gauge attached that reads between 0 and 200 psi several hydrant wrenches, and obviously things to record the results. When doing a fire flow test, you need to test two hydrants that are spaced far apart if possible. One hydrant is designated the pressure hydrant and the other is designated the flow hydrant. So, one two and a half inch cap on the residual hydrant is removed and the pressure cap is put on. The residual hydrant is opened and the air is bled from the barrel. When a steady stream of water is coming from the gauge, the hydrant is opened all the way. The reading on the residual hydrant now reads the static pressure. Record this. Remove a cap from the flow hydrant and fill the inside to determine the hydrant circumference, or excuse me, the coefficient. Open the hydrant and allow the water to flow from the outlet. Be sure to open the hydrant all the way. Record the flow pressure at the flow hydrant and record the residual pressure at the residual hydrant. And at the flow hydrant, this is where you're gonna use that pitot gauge. Close the hydrant valve slowly. Shut down the residual hydrant. Open the peacock bleeder valve to relieve the pressure within the gauge. 
and remove the cap and gauge. Replace the hydrant cap. Usual results should raise a red flag because they usually mean that something is wrong. And I don't really expect you guys to know how to do flow test if you're not familiar with it. This is more just a, a, a vague familiarity of the process and what it entails. I don't expect you to go out and actually do a flow test. The Hazen Williams formula. The design of a water system for a community is the responsibility of the water department engineer. One of the primary challenges they face is the termination of flows and friction loss for domestic consumption and firefighting requirements for the community. There are various pipe flow formulas available, but of those available, the Hazen Williams is the most often used in designing of a water distribution system. Again, this is something that's more just for your information and something that you really don't need to commit to memory. This is just how they come up with how much water needs to be in the system in order to meet the community demands. And of course, at the end of the day, whatever the number is they come up with is what we're stuck with and we gotta make do with it. So obviously training and knowing your hydrants are a great advantage in taking care of fire protection for your community. In a perfect world, a map of the water system will be displayed in every fire station and in offices of command officers. And you may be lucky and have one, but water supply maps on a large scale are broken down into smaller groups and should be carried on all fire apparatus and in command cars. This will give you a good idea of where hydrants are and their flow rates in a given area. Needed fire flow for an interior fire. If the first floor of a building is 100% involved with fire, the established procedure is to divide the square footage of the first floor by three to determine the amount of water that will be needed to extinguishing and controlling the interior fire. So the formula is as follows, length times width divided by three. And again, this is just a rough guesstimation. If only a portion of the fire floor is involved, the needed fire flow is based upon the percentage of the square footage of the building that is involved. So here's our example. If the fire is a one story, 1500 square foot, single family dwelling, and involves 50%, and they've already multiplied the length time width for you there, the needed fire flow would be as follows. For the entire flow, it would be 1500 divided by three, so you would need to have a hydrant that flew 500 gallons per minute. Since only 50% is involved, you're actually just going to Cut that in half, and your needed flow is 250 gallons per minute. The procedure for determining the needed fire flow that has been developed by the National Fire Academy also includes a procedure for determining the amount of fire flow needed for exterior exposures, meaning things on each side of the house or object that's burning that you need to keep from burning. So you need to have an idea of how much more water you need to protect them. Its procedure requires 25% or basically one fourth of the needed interior fire flow for each of the exterior exposures. So for example, the fire flow needed for the interior fire in that single family home was 250 gallons per minute. So if there were two external exposures involved in this fire, it would be 62.5 gallons per minute, which is basically a quarter of 250. And that would be needed for each exposure or 125 gallons per minute for the two exposures total. 
And that's in addition to the 250 gallons that you're already flowing. So you're looking at needing a total of 375 gallons per minute from your hydrant to adequately fight this fire. The fire flow required for each floor of a multi-store building should be handled as if it were an individual single-story building. For example, if both the first and second floor of a two-story structure are well involved with fire, the fire flow needed for the first floor would be determined and the same amount would be needed for the second floor. So, if it were determined that 1,500 gallons per minute was needed for the first floor, an additional 1,500 gallons per minute would be needed for the second floor for a total of 3,000 gallons per minute to adequately control the fires on both floors. Now, let's change it up a little bit. If the first floor is totally involved and only 50% of the second floor is involved, then you would only need 1,500 gallons per minute for the first floor and then 750 gallons for the second floor because it's only 50% involved, remember? Needed fire flow for interior exposures. Serious consideration should be given to the amount of water needed to control interior exposures. The primary need for interior exposure protection exists in fires in multi-story buildings. So what they're saying is make sure you have enough water to keep a fire in check and confine it to say just one apartment and try to keep it from spreading to the apartment above or to the sides. The same principle applies as to the amount of water required per exterior exposure. For example, 25% of the fire flow needed for the first floor is needed for each interior stairwell in a two-story structure. So, the entire first floor of a 6,000 square foot two-story commercial building is involved with fire. There are two stairwells between the first and second floor. There are two exterior exposures at ground level. So the amount of water would be needed for controlling and extinguishment of this fire. The first floor would be 6,000 because that's the total square feet, right? Divided by three, which will give us 2,000 gallons per minute. The ground floor exterior exposure protection is half of the 2,000. So that would be 1,000 gallons per minute. Or not. And interior exposure protection, of the two stairwells, would also be 1,000 gallons per minute. So a total needed fire flow of 4,000 gallons per minute would be needed to adequately control this fire. Okay, so that's just one little little math problem. I know I kind of promised you guys that you wouldn't have any, and this is true. Uh, you're not going to have any math problems per se for, for this chapter because we ended it enough with, of course, uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. So again... If you guys have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can call me at the office at 706-357-0162. If you have any questions and you want immediate response, please look at Blackboard Collaborate, the calendar there in Blackboard, and go to Blackboard Collaborate on a given time, and we can discuss the problems you're having and figure out a solution. Until then, have a great day.